Gina was actually one of the uh, first ones uh, that uh, actually needed to orient itself, point at things, maneuver, etc. So you know that's uh, kind of the beginning of it, and that's really what hydrazine started to become uh, sought out for is for that type of maneuvering capability that spacecrafts uh, started to require more and more. Hydrazine typically has been what has been used for small satellites. You just put that into your thruster and there's little catalyst granules when they chemi when uh, you heat those up and the monopropellant hits those it reacts and that's all you need. It gets hot and comes out really fast. I have participated in load operations with hydrazines and mixed oxides of nitrogen and it is a tremendous effort and you carry a little bit of duress with you when you're in operations. So if you are going to handle it you have to wear very special suits, you have to have a lot of people there just in case something bad did happen uh, and anyone not involved with that is completely out of the building. Um, so it's not even just the cost of the fuel, it's those logistical pieces. Oh, we have to have people specially trained, we have to have folks with the right equipment, we have to take extra time, so that's salaries, you know, you know, extra hours. So it's not just the fact that we have those additional safety headaches or, or requirements um, to keep people safe, it's, it's the additional logistical trail uh, that is a lot of, uh, of, of you, know, you know, money. Back in the early 90s, uh, under the Air Force, of Office, uh, Air Force Office of Scientific Research, AFOSR, uh, they funded a very interesting research into a new class of molecules called energetic ionic liquids. They have very low vapor pressure, they have uh, very high densities, uh, they have a uh, very good performance, and they have a very wide liquid range. We developed uh, a propellant, a liquid monopropellant for spacecraft that these properties lend themselves very well for very low toxicity because of the reduced vapor pressure. We go from a hydrazine where you have to wear a, a full special suit to our green propellants where you have to wear glasses, maybe a face shield, some gloves, and that's about it. As well as having this high density and higher performance, it offered 50% better performance uh, in volumetric uh, impulse over hydrazine. So that allows you to do a lot of different things. You can either have one satellite that stays up there a lot longer. You can have a satellite that carries a lot more uh, with it, a lot more payload, can do a lot more things for the time it's up there. Or uh, it can allow you to use smaller rockets, launch vehicles to launch your satellite into orbit. And then along came uh, the GPIM mission. And the GPIM mission was a wonderful opportunity for us to do all the, the ladder development. You know, it's one thing to look at just the, you know, the propellant thruster, but the compatibility with all of the components. So uh, this really brought both the propellant and, the, and uh, tanks, thrusters, valve, uh, compatibility all to an operational level that made it suitable for spaceflight missions. GPIM was a culminating event for us. Um, the, really the key impact there was the demonstration of the AFRL developed monopropellant ascent. The flight demonstration was key but it was also establishing an accepted presence at the launch pad for uh, performing all of the operations, the ground operations. And we are saving a ton of money on the handling, loading of this stuff, and a lot of the safety issues associated with hydrazine. Right now, you have to, uh, you know, suit up in full bunny suits with air conditioning tubes coming in to keep the uh, clean air flowing. You know, you put on a mask here, like you're at the dentist office, so you're, you're not getting anything contaminants in there, and you handle the stuff with gloves in an open room environment. It's not just you know the the propellant benefits, but it's the operational benefits as well that sometimes. To be perfectly honest, I don't know if we could ever quantify, um, but they do. We do know they're a huge, huge part of the uh, of the pie as far as cost. Currently, there is not a U.S. supplier of hydrazine available, so we've had a stockpile that we've been relying on for the last several years, and that stockpile is slated to run out in about 2026 or so. And so after that, we'll be reliant on uh, foreign suppliers. You know, we we can't really count on the fact that it's going to have the same 
purity standards. And because it doesn't have the same purity standards, we really can't guarantee how it's actually going to perform whenever we put it in a thruster. So, you know, with these, you know, multi-million, you know, even billion dollar satellites, you know, we really don't want to put those at risk with a um, subpar type of propellant. And what makes Ascent so great is that it offers about a 50% or so performance boost over hydrazine. And so you can imagine, you know, what you can do with that, um, you know, going forward into space and, you know, really, you know, it's going to be key to building our future, future space force and, um, you know, architectures in space. So many people's work went into that uh, spacecraft and it was a great deal of anticipation uh, on all of our parts that this be a success. This was only, this was the second Falcon Heavy that had ever flown and we were all very nervous and uh, it was quite emotional uh, when, when it, it took off and was successful and watching the Falcon Heavy was quite a show. It was a, it was a great evening and I didn't mind staying up all night.